Everything has a beginning. Every war has a first battle. Every rivalry has first blood spilt. Sometimes that spilt blood is what the entire rivalry is based off of. Sometimes it gets completely lost to history, and the tales of waged war afterwards are what every fan knows and knows well. But not every rivalry in hockey, in fact almost none, have cultural connotations. Connotations over cultural identity that have their roots in Quebec nationalism and are inseparable from it. The presence of an almost ethnic prejudice between two teams would help define hockey in Quebec for all time. Before the Cote no goal call, before the Good Friday Massacre, there was the first battle, the greatness of which largely goes unremembered, yet it would catalyze the most furious rivalry of the 1980s and one of the greatest blood feuds of all time. Obviously, this episode covers a far back generation in hockey history, so there's going to be a lot of educational asides in this video as well. To begin with, let's look at the lineup of the favorite team, the Montreal Canadiens. Guy Lafleur needs no introduction, one of the most beloved players of all time. In the 81-82 season, he suffered a very noticeable dip in goal production, dropping from 50 goals to under 30, but he made up for it by scoring his 1,000th career point towards the end of the year. The d which was amazing that year, needs the most love here, so get ready for this lineup. At one point in history, and for many years, these three players were on the same team. Larry Robinson, Rod Langway, and Brian Engblom. Combined, that year they boasted a plus-minus of 200. In net was the tender young Rick Walmsley. At 22 years old, he somehow got the starter's role for the playoffs behind one of the most storied franchise's best teams ever, and he was fifth in Vesna voting. Even after these guys, the Habs also had Keith Acton, center who came out of absolutely nowhere to lead the team with 88 points, Mark Napier, Mario Tremblay, Steve Shutt, Guy Lapointe, Doug Jarvis, Bob Gainey. Do I need further descriptions? The Canadiens created a bona fide dynasty in the mid-70s, winning it all six times in that decade. Even if there were only 14 to 16 teams in the whole league, that's still a remarkable achievement. Now, with 20 teams in the league, it was becoming slightly more difficult to maintain that clip, but even with a subsequent division realignment, they still easily secured first place. For the Quebec Nordiques, life wasn't quite so easy. They limped into the playoffs, winning only two of their last 10 games. Their offense was awesome, but their defense couldn't keep up. Actually, they scored only four fewer goals than the Canadiens. It was their third season in the NHL since the WHA merger, where they didn't have nearly the same success the Canadiens did, and they had yet to win a playoff round in the NHL. They had the pieces to do it, though, if they were playing a team, aside from Montreal. To start, kid phenom Dale Hunter. At only 21, he was still a baby goat, still swinging fists and agitating and scoring and playmaking. What a guy. Next up is the one and only Peter Stastny, who, oh my god, scored almost 150. 40 points that year. In the record books of best players to never win a cup, I never hear his name come up enough. I mean, Stosh was the 1980s second highest scorer behind only Gretzky. This was only his second season, and he deservedly was one of the runners up for the Hart Trophy. His brothers Marion and Anton were great, but I mean, they're not Peter. But there's no shame in that. Last up is another very young Michel Goulet, who also helped fuel that Nordique's offense. It's little wonder everyone I've chosen to list here are forwards. Backing out a bit, there was also a sentiment in some places, some, not all, that Quebec was the true Quebecois team, and that Montreal were the sellouts. Isn't that funny to think about now that Montreal is the only francophone team now? Guy Lafleur, who, again, is universally loved today, was booed to kingdom come by the Nordiques fans. There was a lot of cultural tension underpinning this rivalry. Does it make sense? Maybe for them. And that's all that matters, really. In any case, in hindsight, this rivalry is nothing without that element. With much hype and press, the stage was set for Game 1 at the legendary Montreal Forum. There's no footage I can find of this one, but apparently there wasn't much to see unless you're a Habs fan. The Canadiens outshot the Nordiques 41-19, and the score reflected that monster disparity. Mario Tremblay got it going early for the Canadiens, and a too-many-men penalty on the Nordiques 12 minutes later cost them another goal. Just over halfway through the second, Tremblay added another. 
In the third, while on the same penalty kill, a game misconduct to Mario Merois, Doug Jarvis and Mark Napier made it 4 and 5 to nothing. Anton Stastny got one, yay. So it was an utter drubbing. Nobody really expected any different, with Montreal being the 20-man wrecking ball that they were and had been for decades, in front of their home crowd no less. Funny enough, to that point, Quebec had still never won a game in the Forum. Brutal. But what's even more brutal is that the 140-point man for the Nordiques, Peter Stastny, would be out for the rest of the series with an injury. The Nordiques' killer offense, which on paper was the only hope they had of matching the Canadians anywhere, was down for the count early. On April 8th, a day where the weather was absolutely wretched and miserable, the Canadians couldn't have felt better about themselves, and the Nordiques couldn't have felt worse. Having peppered Bouchard in Game 1, the Canadians came out ready to throttle him again but Bouchard forced a lot of early whistles to stunt any momentum Montreal may have created. Coincidental high-sticking penalties to Larry Robinson and Wally Weir would open up the ice, and an eventual Nordiques power play would get them their first lead of the series. Keep it in, in front it comes. Over Pete Chetacucci, now to... Oh, I was frothing at the mouth at the chance to see a typical 80s goalie give up a goal that would never be scored with a goalie from today, but... That's a lucky bounce that doesn't discriminate by decade. Later in the period, with two men already in the box, the Nordiques would compound the manpower deficit. Aubrey breaks his stick and gets his drop on it, and the crowd hollering for it. A penalty on Aubrey. It was a classic case of dumb penalties robbing the players and fans of what should have been a spirited game. It couldn't last forever, of course, but the power plays still had to expire. Back now for the Nordiques, Kamel. Out of the penalty box. Aubrey is getting a break for you. And he fired it high. Robinson's pass knocked down. Here's Hunter getting a break for the back for you. He's fired it high. Robinson playing it into the corner. Ando turning around, gets it on the Chicago. There's a shot. It's off to Brad there. By the third. Halfway through the first, this is what the penalty box looked like, and this is what the scoreboard looked like. Relics of a bygone age. In any case, with only two shots on net to that point, the Canadians needed to get something going. Right side, here comes Akin going in on goal, shoots and he fired at one. And once the teams were back to the familiar five on five, the juggernaut Canadians went to work. Uh, Hunter and Trombley with 52. Atkins streaking in on that right side of the drop pass to LaFleur over to the car there. It's a punch. Back in! Stop! By Atkins. You have a goal. You can't do much better than that. Now the Canadians get on the right side. Not in going in. Couldn't get the shot away the first time. The Nordiques were also content to take advantage of the now defunct freezing the puck in the defensive zone. Boy, that seems like such a cheat code nowadays. Of note is that the massive Bob Ganey somehow got rocked. Canadian Hunter Jarvis for Ganey. Ganey around the net, trying to jam it in, it's into the crease area. Unfortunately, most of the first was played between the two blue lines, until, guess what happened for the billionth time in this young game? Some lovely French yapping graced our screens as the period expired, but largely the first period was one to forget. Montreal was still looking for that killer instinct that defined their team. Napier going in, Napier is around the net. Trying to center it, center it in right over the front, they get just the big And who else but Guy Lafleur, capitalizing off some brutal puck watching by the Nordiques that they absolutely could not afford to do against a team like Montreal. Unfortunately, the Canadians could not get sustained pressure as a result of that goal, but at least they did so while not trailing. Still, for the prestigious Canadians, that's not enough. Hey, it's that trophy guy. At this point, even the commentators started to get a little tired of the tightness of the game. My goodness, with Quebec having only three shots in this period, they only or this game so far, Bobby. The Canadians have to be doing something in that regard to no, no. Apparently, God speaks French. In behind the net is locker, he centers the defense into the crease, and it's not wide enough. This one was pretty similar to Lafleur's goal. The scramble in front of the net just lasts way too long if you're a Nordique, and your vaunted defensive play in this game costs you at the worst time. The Canadians figured they'd found the secret formula. Just hope for a net mouth scramble. On to it goes right into the crease. And then, finally, fire wagon hockey. 
temporary period back to Acton coming in on that wing. Here's Acton around the net, trying to come those down. Back it comes. Victor to backhand one. Here's the lead pass. Oh, the back play. Back it play. They come back. Oh, okay. After the curve has made the end. Well, kind of. The Canadiens' defense gets caught flat-footed on both the keep-in and the rush-up eyes. Despite the great defensive play by Picard, it's enough to tie the game again. Also, no goalie is letting this in after 1995. Fleur picked his head up late and took an elbow to the unprotected gourd from Rochefleur towards the end of the frame, and my goodness, how he stayed in, I don't know, that's toughness. Despite many more chances in the middle frame, there would be no further scoring. A 2-2 tie welcomed both teams entering the third. Now, you may be surprised as I was to learn that the Canadiens were out shooting the Nordiques 26-8. Good grief. It's obvious that they had the edge, but those numbers are damned liars. The Canadians had no excuses for still being tied with an inferior team if that were the case. But they were. Remember that this is only a best of five. If the Canadians do find their footing and win, the Nordiques are all of a sudden facing elimination. If the Nordiques somehow pull off a win, it's only a best of three. Both teams would be playing with a lot of desperation, and it's only game two. Hey, Gengra. He loses it there to Kote. Doesn't get loose pass. Here it is, in the right oh, the Now, in this play, tell me if you see another instance of something that has happened throughout this game. That's right, terrible puck control. The Canadiens defensemen had two opportunities to either corral the puck or huck it out of the zone. But all they could manage was to bunt it to Rochefleur, who's sinking that shot every day of the week. But the Canadiens still had three quarters of a period to get it back. Ultimately, the opportunism of the Nordiques would win the day, and the series was somehow tied at one. The Nordiques' first ever win in Montreal only deserved a short-lived celebration, because they knew that a team like Montreal would be keen to extract quick revenge for a playoff loss. And because some things never change, both teams drew early offsetting penalties, but at the very least, that meant the ice would be opened up. Here's Hunter over the line! To the short side! No score into the And he is on! On the offset! Hard up over to Cloutier! Cloutier going in, shoots at the rebound! Another offside! And one play coming up, one two three. A few minutes in, we were treated to an <clears throat> fight fought with grabbing hands worthy of the 21st century NHL. Wamsley continued to be shelled by the Nordiques counterattack. Physical play picked up as well. Finally. And some of the nastiness and chirping carried over as was expected. But there'd be no real fireworks. Yet. 
the story of the first continued to be the goaltenders. Breaking it up. Boutier got it over there. Hey, took the shot. Robinson is over the other side. There's the shot on top of Lake of Boucher. But they caught on it. Lewis and Hamel is going to clear it. Up and back. So Lafleur is going to get in front of Mondoon. So Lafleur it goes. The shot. And an enormous save there. But something had to give. And John. To the side that everybody's going to be The first goofy goal of the series saw the puck fly over the net way above the goal line, hit Dale Hunter before he shot it, and then he stuffed it under Wamsley's pads. Wamsley thought he had it, but it's pretty clearly sitting behind his skates there. It was a late period goal that the Nordiques could only hope could be a mental backbreaker for the legendary Canadian squad opposite them. Under to Cloutier. Cloutier going in with Goulet, Cloutier around the net, but they the shoot, they score! Hunter again! Who says the Nordiques couldn't match the Canadian's skill? Cloutier finally gets himself on the board with a run and gun play behind the net to Hunter, who is proving to be a thorn in the Habs' side. As the commentators pointed out, the last thing the Nordiques wanted to do was sit on a lead that, if it held, would put the Canadiens up against elimination. As I watched this for the first time, I wondered if maybe that was the wrong strategy. Their defensive posture had been stellar since Game 1, so inviting the Canadiens into a firewagon style game might play into what they were good at a little too much. Rod Langway was simply content to play the game without a bucket and with a stick of gum. What a way to start a comeback. The Nordiques came out screaming in the second. Center right area. Anton Stasmeter, the rebound, reset! Their frustration started to get the better of them, but taking even one of them off the ice was just fine by the Nordiques if it opened the ice up a little more. We'll get position. Back to Robinson. Somehow, the Nordiques did end up shorthanded, but still gave the Canadiens nothing. One thing I noticed around this time was that shot blocking was way more effective in this era of hockey, mostly because defensemen didn't have the puck control or mobility skills to make a convincing slap pass or abort their shot and perform a deke. If they wound up, it's a guaranteed howitzer. So going down in the general direction of the shot proved to be particularly effective. The broadcast team again pointed out something that was very interesting. Pat Hickey roughed up Rod Langway after the whistle. Rod Langway? Who should have pounded that little twerp into the Earth's crust? Hickey wasn't known as a physical player then. Their speculation was that Coach Bergeron had infused the Nordiques with a fearless gusto, and it appeared to have a lot of merit. It would be exactly the kind of confidence that they needed to eliminate the Canadians. But it's only game three. Let's see if they move it around. And it came back out over the line. That is not the type of play that brings about productivity. Canadians started to find their footing into the final period. Trying to get that to get it out in front. Back to the car. There's a shot. Two puck in front. Big save there by Boucher. A shot from the line. Boucher got another shot. And a splendid play. Over on this side. Langway has shot. Oh, did he see that? But it was too little, too late. The Canadiens showed some spirit in after-whistle skirmishes, but that's arguably where and when it matters the least at this juncture. A 6-on-5 goal proved to be fruitless, and the Nordiques took a 2-1 to -one series lead. That was the Canadiens' last mulligan. The year prior, in 1981, the high-flying Canadiens similarly underachieved in the first round, falling to the then-lowly 14th-place Edmonton Oilers in a pathetic three-game sweep that put Gretzky's Oilers on the map, and many worried it was the first real sign that the Canadiens' dynasty was in trouble. Now, those fears were greatly in danger of being fully realized. But they weren't out yet. Looking to avoid a second straight year of playoff heartbreak, the Canadiens arrived at La Calise all business. Just look at them. They probably have Uzis under those threads. Early signs did not bode well for them. Coming in on my right wing, there's Goulet going in for a shoot! And he was able to go far. Now 
I'm speeding this up, but the Canadians were being absolutely suffocated to start Game 4. It really looked like absolutely nothing was going to change for them. They had no life. And then, for apparently no reason at all, they did. While we were away and while they were lined up to start the game, a fight broke out. It's Mark Hunter. Point shot bomb from Picard caught the glass just right to gift Reisbrow his first goal of the series and a much leaded 1-0 lead for the Canadians. So, if goals are hard to come by, and if instigating a fight led to a goal, what's the next logical step? It is Brubaker, and now we have a fight between Raleigh Weir and Jeff. This turns into a whole circus, so let me narrate for you. After Weir takes down Brubacher, Nyland and Hickey try to give each other Heimlichs. Weir gets up and doesn't cotton much to Nyland punching his teammate's face, but he can't get to him. Tardif shoves over Acton, who would survive. Acton tries to get involved with the Heimlich twins and gets hilariously planted by Hamel. Somehow, Rog Langway and a Nordic who remains unidentified to this day just kinda wrestle. Wally Weir still wants a piece of someone, just as the commentators bemoan fighting like a loser. Some things never ch- oh my god. Nyland just suckered Hickey, and that sets the whole powder keg off again. Hamel continues to aid the economy by keeping Nyland secured to the floor. But lo, what's this? Gloves off and squaring up? Here we go. Or here we don't go, I guess. Pichette was willing, but Langway just kind of... didn't. Dale Hunter and another future capital and Brian Engblom decided to tango a bit, and then separated due to differences in core values. Live from Quebec City. The poor officials took pen to paper to record all the penalty minutes from that line brawl. 159 penalties minutes in total. And guess what? There'd be almost 100 more to come. More incredibly insightful thoughts from the commentators on fighting in hockey. Gentlemen, I, I have to get one thing clear. I, I, I'm under the impression, Danny, that you think I enjoy the fighting and the brawling and everything. I don't. No, no, I, 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 I don't enjoy that part of it, but I think as a player, when you're challenged, you know, there's two things that you're going to do. Either skate away and take it, or make a stand and give it right back. And that's the position that the Canadians are in tonight. Well, I think that is an inescapable situation. However, uh, like you, I deplore the fisticuffs. They take away from the beauty of hockey. But there is another blemish that uh, a brawl of this magnitude leaves on the hockey body. And that is where the fans suffer because you have the talented stars, many of them, who are out of circulation for a considerable period of time. Well, that's right, Dan. Then all you have to do is get rid of it completely. For some reason, that half-hour reset was exactly what both teams needed to return to 80s hockey and its fire wagon roots. Now, is going to the goal. Came on, getting a five. Anton Sarsby shot the shot. There's Dupont. He is the crossbar. Shooting it down the ice. Now the Canadians going after it. Napier going in there. They score! Bond two. So the second shorthanded goal of the night. He tried to up there blindly. Gutierrez shot. He's touching in front of the rebound. Here's the break for Rysdow. Rysdow is going right in on goal. He shoots on a magnificent save. And it was whistled by Bond two. Finally coming up with the break. He scores. After him is Tardif, here's Hickey against Robinson, right in the touchdown! And a Herculean effort there, Gutierrez. Ahead it goes to Hogan to the left wing, has Julius coming in! And not a moment too soon, the Canadiens began to pull away. Now Langley, very slowly to the line. Over to Trombley, Ull is getting in from Trombley. Here's a shot, it's Steve, they score! They were in the net, the players on him. That's going to count. That's the 
Ricky LaFleur. But according to this ledger here, we're still about 100 penalty minutes short. So that happened, and somehow all that wouldn't be the most penalty-inducing game of this rivalry, not by a long shot. It was back to the Forum, the den of the greatest modern dynasty for a winner-take-all game. For the Nordiques, a win would be a heart-stopping, jubilant victory against a team nobody gave them a shot against. For the Canadiens, a vindication of their status as a dynasty that would demonstrate that they could still get it done even when all else seemed to fail them. One game remains in one team's season. And both teams were ready to play the game of their lives. On the back Canadians with the lead pass, and it's a giveaway, actually. Here's the third, firing it. Now it's Hunter, the long pass over to the center, pulling going in. And Lons, they came out, breaking into the center ice area with turn up the pass over on the other side. It's a Montreal's supposed best defense in the league completely forgot about Piemont crashing the net, and the Habs again found themselves in a hole. And they flirted with digging a deeper one. Get away from Jenga. In front it comes. There's the shot. Big save by Wamsley. Gloria scoring opportunity by Cote. Here's Napier. Over the ground. And another shot. Another shot by Robinson. It could be two on one. Here's Hunter. Hunter getting set, he's setting it in, and in front! Aside from sporadic chances, neither team really broke away. It would be another Montreal mistake that widened the gap. The Canadiens tried to be too cute with a puck they were trying to freeze, and instead of clearing it out of harm's way, it pinballs to Anton Stastny, who made them pay. Getting cutesy is not a mistake a team like the Canadiens can make in the playoffs, and that blunder put them in a 2-0 hole in a winner-take-all game. If they were going to win, they'd have to show us the stuff of champions. There's a lead pass, here's Napier going in on goal. A lead having goal was waved off by offsides. And guys, if you thought offside wave offs are bad now, just know that some things haven't changed. And then we got faked out again. Lifted up by Robinson and it came off the backboards and went underneath. Larry Robinson leaned on the net and the puck slithered off the end boards and underneath. In the land of make believe and the land of blind Montreal loyalties, this is a tie game. But not in the real world. Those kinds of setbacks can mentally break a team. But this is the tail end of the Canadiens' dynastic power. It's still very much them. They're not going quiet. After a rough and unproductive second period, the Habs had 20 minutes to get two. On paper, for a team like that, that's peanuts. But given their trajectory, it was no small order. One furious effort, the first in a while for the Canadiens, bore fruit courtesy of Mario Tremblay. And then he got decked by Acton. And just like that, with less than nine minutes to go, the big brother played like the big brother again. Back for Acton, there's the shot! 10.49, Tremblay from Langley and Acton. Tim's This is 
Listen to that crowd. You will rarely see jubilant animation like this for a tying goal. Larry Robinson mobs Picard as he reaches the bench. Everything was getting right back on track for the Canadiens. But it's only a tie. Neither team is out of the woods yet. Now it's on his foot again. The first shooting at Ben Hall. Check out, here's the two on one. Stasny. Going in with Cote. Stasny over to Cote. He's good for the ball. As the end of regulation quickly approached, the viewer base knew that the next goal was going to be enough. The Canadiens, though they were a good enough team to eliminate the Nordiques twice over already, had all the momentum going into the break. If they score next, their inability to do anything in games 2, 3, and most of 5 will be forgotten forever, and the Nordiques will just be a footnote to history. The Nordiques, on the other hand, had relied on the splendid play of their netminder Bouchard to maintain their early lead. You couldn't have asked anything more from him or his team on the whole, considering their station, and a 2-0 lead that seemed to be miles wider than that was gone. But they only needed one to do the unthinkable and to blow the Eastern Conference wide open. One goal to take Game 5. One goal to take the series, the bragging rights of Quebec, and the first playoff series win of the Nordiques Canadiens rival. So the overtime is underway, and the Canadians clear it in, and 100 going in with Jarvis and Gainey. Englaw moves up along the line, trying to get a face-off for us there, Quebec. Taking it up, and they lug it into the center right there, he'll throw one. Quincy up to Hunter, Hunter back to Quincy. Oh, and he missed it open it. It's open again. A shot. Will they keep it out? How does that box stay out? To this day, I don't think there exists a single bit of footage that showed Dale Hunter's shot going over the goal line. But given the reaction of every player there, both Canadian and Nordique, that puck found pay dirt. The Canadians once again found themselves on the business end of playoff heartbreak, and this disappointment would lead to some drastic roster changes. In one sense, as their dynasty died, another franchise was given new life, as Engblom, Jarvis, Lachlan, and Langway would all be traded to a certain Washington Capitals franchise. The Nordiques had taken beatings from the larger, more powerful, more popular Canadiens, but they had stuck it to them in all the ways you could hope to, in their own barn, as the underdog, in overtime, on a goal from a player that they despised. What little victories the Nordiques had had to that point had never been so sweet. Future years and future encounters between these two teams would be even better as the rivalry moved on to bigger and better things, but that shouldn't nor does detract from the wonderful, if unrecognized, first chapter of the Battle of Quebec. And while this rivalry is gone, as only one of its teams still stands, maybe one day, perhaps soon, its younger brother will come home again a little older, and a little wiser. And if they do come back, even if Montreal is prepared to hate them, I can't help but think that maybe they'll also be a little glad. shots at him one night and you couldn't put a pee past him after I drilled him in the shoulder and knocked him out for about 15 minutes. <laughs>